Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of our PPCS event. And today we're going to uh, teach you about message passing with MPI, or the art of uh, programming distributed memory machines. My name is Christy uh, Lift, and I work here at the IT Center. So our agenda for today will be something like, uh, we'll start with a bit of motivation about what MPI is for, and then I'll introduce you to the basic concepts of uh, MPI, like point-to-point uh, -point communication and non-blocking operations. And then with the second part, which will come in the afternoon, I'll tell you something about the more complicated things in like collective operations and also uh, creating additional communicators in MPI, hybrid parallelization, and um, there were about two very common uh, patterns that occur almost any time when you program in uh, something with MPI. And then in the afternoon um, tool sessions, we're going to introduce you to um, one tool which is called Vampire and uh, the, a library called Vampire Trace, which you can use to debug and uh, yeah, profile MPI applications. So we'll start with the motivation now. Uh, <coughs> So nowadays, most uh, big compute machines are basically distributed memory machines. So those of you who were here yesterday, Christian already told you about different kinds of uh, architectures that we have in high performance computing. So the, there were basically two kinds of, of machines, one that have shared memory where all processes can share access the same uh, memory storage and there is the distributed memory systems which has separate memory uh, and uh, CPUs. So the uh, majority of big machines nowadays are distributed memory machines because shared memory doesn't scale beyond a certain number of CPUs. So when you need a bigger machine, you have to build something which is called a multi-computer or a cluster, where you basically have many machines uh, connected with some kind of high-speed network. And what is important in this case is that, for example, this uh, thing here, which is called usually a node, a compute node, it has its own CPU and memory no uh, installed on it, but it cannot directly access memory located on a different node. So there are some architectures where this is possible, but in most of them this is not possible. So what you need to do is you, have to you need to have a, a mechanism which allows you explicitly to transfer data between uh, the nodes. And this mechanism is usually called message passing because the abstraction of sending data from one node to another node happens in something which is called a message. And uh, message passing is the uh, mechanism way to do that. So what we have here, we have uh, many nodes and each node runs uh, their own operating system. Uh, maybe some kind of very stripped down, very bare bone operating system, but still uh, some kind of operating system. So there is nothing like a single image of one operating system that runs on all nodes, like what you have in uh, shared memory systems. So there are many uh, abstractions when you talk about uh, parallel programming. And um, maybe some of you have heard things like uh, MIMD, SIMD, SPMD, and so on. There are many abbreviations. Uh, so what uh, MPI is about is so-called SPMD, which means single program, multiple data. This is just one way to program such machines. It means that the you write a single program, and then multiple copies of that single program are started, and each copy works on a different uh, part of the data set. So MPI is a concrete implementation of this SPMD abstraction. Uh, in SPMD, what you usually have is that each copy of the program obtains somehow a unique ID, and this unique ID can then be used to make different copies do different things. So for example, you can have something like this. Uh, just the, the program compares its own uh, local ID with some kind of specific ID. And if it is uh, comparison is two, then do something. Otherwise, do something else. And if you run this program multiple times, there will be one copy, namely the copy which has ID specific ID, that will execute this, this branch of the code. Otherwise, all other copies will execute the other branch. And you can use these uh, identification mechanisms to build programs that di do different things in the different copies. So here's how a typical SPMD program works. You start with the source code, then you compile the program and link it. You get an executable. And then you launch this executable many times. Uh, possibly, uh, 
this could be operating system processes running on the same machine, but this could also be uh, processes running on many different machines. What you usually have in a cluster environment is that some of the no processes run on the same nodes because most cluster nodes nowadays are multi-core, so you can run many uh, processes at the same time on a single node. But other processes run on different nodes. And then there is this data uh, which somehow gets distributed uh, between the processes. So how the data is distributed, we'll talk about this later. Uh, and then you get this number of processes running, processing their piece of data. So they collectively form the so-called SPMD job. And this is the parallel execution uh, part of the program. And then the data is somehow collected to obtain the result. So this is what you typically do. But the important thing is that you have a single source code here. And this single source code produces a single executable, or maybe several executables if you have a heterogeneous system, because nowadays uh, you have things like uh, host machines with Intel mics put on them. You can also use MPI to uh, make the host talk to the mic and the mics to talk uh, between to e each other. Uh, but then you have one executable which runs on the host machine, and then you need a bit different executable to run on the mic. But in general, you have something like an executable. So it, it, this is just, you can have different executables, but they're still built from the same source code. So that's, that's the idea here. So you, you write a single program. You don't write like 100 co different programs to run on 100 different nodes. You write one program which runs on 100 nodes. OK, so a process uh, is something which, um, so you have, a, you, ha you, ha you have an algorithm. Then this algorithm is implemented some program written in some programming language like C, Fortran, or I don't know, C Sharp, or whatever. And then when you compile this thing, you get an executable file. And then when this executable file is loaded, so when it's executed by the operating system, it creates something which is called a process. And processes, so this is the image in the memory of a pro of program which is running. So like an executable file, which is which contains some instructions and data. So when you start executing this executable file, the operating system creates something which is called a process. So the process is like in-memory image of the, of the program, and it contains the binary code, so the instructions for the program. But it also has something which is called a state. So it has heap data, it has some stack data, it has uh, CPU registers associated with this program, like current state of the CPU, it also could have one or more threads of execution. And then you have operating system context, like signals that can be delivered. You can have IO input output handles, like open files, open communication channels. But what is important is that each process ha in modern operating systems runs in so called virtual other space, which means that the process sees some kind of uh, memory space, but this memory space it usually appears linear because most operating systems nowadays they only use linear addressing. But this address space is only belongs to the process. So two processes, they have com they have completely different virtual address spaces. So one address which exists in one process is completely meaningless in a different process. And then uh, you have something. So the processes cannot access each other's memory directly because it only see, uh, each process only sees a piece of memory which the operating system makes sure belongs to this process. And then there is no direct mechanism for one process to directly access another process because uh, processes do not access physical memory. They access virtual memory, and this virtual memory, these addresses, they are somehow translated to addresses in physical memory. And the operating system makes sure that one virtual address space does not contain uh, things that are in other address space. So processes cannot directly take uh, uh, data from each other. There are mechanisms in the operating system that usually allows you to do that, but you have to use the operating system. So you have to go through some kernel uh, services to do that. And then each process usually has something which is called a process identifier or PIT. So this virtual address space uh, provides isolation. So you have processes which are isolated from each other. If one process fails, it doesn't bring all the other processes down, which is a good thing nowadays. Uh, but it requires an additional mechanism. So you have to have some special mechanism to, to exchange data. This is usually called interprocess uh, uh, mechanism, or IPC, interprocess communication. And you also do not have direct mechanisms to synchronize the processes. You need operating system for this thing. So the, uh, when you talk about interprocess communication, there are several mechanisms to do that now. So the, the most uh, simple one is the so-called shared memory mechanism. 
so the operating system can basically uh, map the same physical memory into many different virtual data spaces. And then you can have one memory block which is visible by all processes. So when one of them writes something in this memory block, it becomes immediately visible in the other uh, processes. So this is called shared memory. But the problem with shared memory is that it's, it's only restricted to machines that can actually support shared memory. And then um, you have the file system, so you can write a file, and if you have a network file system, if you write something to a file, it becomes visible to other programs which run on different uh, nodes, but it's slow. So you um, usually uh, file systems are designed to store data, not to uh, exchange data fast. And then uh, you have the ubiquitous networking, which uh, like internet uh, networks and so on. Uh, with networking, you can connect basically everything, anything to anything else. Uh, there are many different networking primit uh, primitives like uh, sockets, name pipes, and so on. But then you have a problem with coordination and addressing. So when you have a, a big uh, system which consists of many nodes and you want to talk between each other, you have to know the addresses and you have to know things like uh, TCP IP ports, numbers, and so on. So this is a bit problematic. So to solve this problem, exists the so-called middleware or special libraries that sit above the operating system but below your, pr your program, which somehow abstract all this addressing and networking stuff. So one of them, of this uh, middleware stuff, is MPI. Uh, there exists other mechanisms like Boeing, which is more like uh, for building vastly distributed uh, applications like SETI at home, Einstein at home, and so on. But it's designed more to work on uh, things where the interaction between the different uh, computation parts is like minimal because it runs on uh, machines which are very separated geographically, widely separated, and uh, it, it works best if there is no communication. And also there are uh, things like the Globus Toolkit, which works with the grid infrastructure, which is another um, networking uh, stuff. But we'll focus on MPI. So just to show you why you need things like MPI, uh, is just a very simple example. If you want to build uh, your program using uh, sockets, uh, there are several questions that you have to so several problems that you have to solve. One of them is uh, how do you ob obtain the list of uh, the communicating partners? So maybe you have to supply this list as a big uh, file, and then all process has to read it somehow. And then um, you have to provide information about how to reach other processes. So when they are started, they open probably network sockets. So these sockets, they have numbers, like TCP port numbers. You have to distribute this data somehow. So you have to solve this problem. And then comes the other problem. Uh, each, each node has a host name, and then you have something like uh, Linux BMC, blah, 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 blah. So th this is a typical uh, address that you have. So this is the host name, and then there's TCP port number. Uh, so this is what you need to open a network socket. And then uh, if you have a program which consists like of a thousand uh, programs, then you need to provide the information about e each program has to know where all the other thousand processes are located. So this information becomes at some point very cumbersome. You need things like writing information to files and then sharing these files with other machines and so on. Then you have to coordinate. So if, how do you launch this program? So if you, if you have a machine with thousand nodes and you want to start your parallel program, how you do that? Do you log into each node and start the program manually, or do you have some kind of a script which uh, uses SSH to start the program remotely? Uh, and then if you have to, for example, redirect the, stand the input output, how you do that? Do you send the data to some special process that does logging, or do you implement some kind of input output redirection? Also, uh, how this integrates with the uh, uh, distributed resource management. For example, if you have a system like we have this uh, platform LSF batch system here, which executes batch jobs. How do you integrate with the batch job? You have to think about this. So you, you have to implement a lot of boilerplate uh, stuff to, to have a parallel program. So why you have to do that when there are libraries? So MPI comes in this um, respect to help you abstract all these things. So if you have a, to have an SPND, uh, successful SPND environment, it has to provide you with certain services that are basically mandatory. So the, the, the most important thing is like uh, identification of the processes that exist in this uh, SPMD job. So this is who uh, is the current process, so providing the, the current ID of the process, and also how many processes are out there. So that 
once you know how many processes are there, you, you know your specific ID, then you, you can use this information to compute on which part of the data the current process has to work on. Then this environment has to provide you with robust mechanisms to exchange data. So this means uh, mechanisms should be able to provide you with means to specify where do you want to send the data, how much data, what kind of data, maybe check if the data has arrived somehow. And then you also need at some place to synchronize your processes, so then you need the synchronization mechanism, which means are all my programs, all copies, do have, have they reached a certain part of the code? Because sometimes it could happen that one program does something, the other part uh, does something else, so they become desynchronized in time. Or also uh, the machines or the clusters that we run on, they're not perfect machines, so some of them might run just a little bit faster than the others. And if your program runs for a very long time, this could lead to some kind of desynchronization. So we need synchronization mechanisms. And also, uh, of course, very important is to provide a method to launch and control the Zeta processes. Okay, so what's MPI? MPI stands for Message Passing Interface, and this is the de facto uh, industry standard for explicit message passing uh, that we use nowadays. So MPI is, is a standard. It's a standard document, very, very large, because every time new things get added to the standard and it's growing and growing, so currently it's like 852 pages. Uh, it's maintained by a non-governmental and non-profit organization called Message Passing Interface Forum. You can visit the web page here at www.mpaforum.org. Uh, and so this is a standard, so it's a specification. It's like, um, I don't know, some abstract specification, and then you have many concrete implementations of this standard. So these implementations are usually libraries uh, and you, you either get them with the supercomputer that you buy, like uh, Cray provides uh, their own MPI library, uh, SGI provides, uh, IBM provides an MPI library for the blue gene, or you can also get uh, various uh, open source or not so open source implementations like Intel MPI, Open MPI, MPitch, MPitch2, NVA Pitch and so on. So MPI is used to describe the interactions or how the processes communicate with each other in such kind of distributed memory machines. Uh, and it's also intended to be source portable, which means that if you write a program using MPI, and if you do not use some operating system specific things for the machine that you wrote your program on, it should be in principle portable. So you just write an MPI program, you test it on your laptop, and then you go to the supercomputing center and you run it on a, some kind of a supercomputer. So this is the idea of uh, MPI. So MPI started in 1994. It's a kind of old standard already. Uh, it started with the so-called bindings. So, so the standard is specifies a set of routines, like uh, operations, and then for each language, it specifies how the actual routine should look like. So what should be the arguments? What should be the return value? How it should? Uh, what kind of co constants you need, and so on. So it started with bind. So this is called binding or concrete implementation of the MPI. So it's interface to the MPI specification. So like interface in that specific language. It started with Fortran 77 and C. Uh, a bit later, there was uh, C++ was added and Fortran 90, and then uh, the last revision of the standard, so version 2.0, which came out uh, two years ago. It. Uh, it deleted C++. So if you're a C++ programmer, ver I'm very sorry, but you have to use the C bindings. But the nice thing is that it added uh, Fortran 2008 binding. So if you write in Fortran, uh, it gets better and better every time. If you write in C, it gets worse. But anyway. Um, so there are many things uh, that were uh, added to the initial standards, like uh, parallel input-output uh, for accessing very large files. Also, uh, newer versions allow things like uh, dynamic process creation, so you can start a program and then it could start another program which works together with the first one, things like this. And it also added uh, language interoperability, so you can write different modules of your program in different languages and then get uh, like C and Photon and they can still interoperate, which is nice because nowadays it becomes popular that you write an interface in C and then you have some Photon library, mathematical library, and you call this library from C. Okay, so there are certain uh, books like uh, references for MPI. So th this is the maybe the most wide known. It's uh, the complete reference. Uh, it exists in versions in volume one and two specifically. So volume one is for MPI one and volume two is for MPI two. Uh, MPI two was 
used to be called the MPI extensions because it was an extension to the MPI standard, but since MPI 2.2, uh, 2.1 actually, uh, there is no longer two versions, so it's just a single uh, standard. There are no longer extensions. But still, MPI 2 is called, uh, it used to be called extension. So if you get those books, uh, you can get the basics of MPI here, and you can get the extensions like uh, parallel I.O., dynamic processes, and so on in the second book. Uh, there are also some books uh, which are more like uh, usage-oriented. So like using MPI or parallel programming with MPI. So those books are nice. Uh, I've, I this, this one contains uh, many examples of things, how, how can they be done with MPI. So those are most like reference books. So they contain all the MPI specification, how, how it's used. But this one is more like solving problems using MPI. Uh, there is also, you can find a lot of information on the web, uh, like the, the MPI forum itself, uh, where you can download all versions of the standard as PDF files. You can also order them as books. Uh, you can order them as books on, on the price for printing, so they don't make money from selling the books. Uh, there is also some uh, tutorials that you can find. You can also uh, go to the web page of OpenMPI. This is our favorite MPI yet. Our still our favorite M MPI implementation, open source. You can download OpenMPI. It also comes bundled with a lot of operating systems. So if you if you have Linux, it usually you can get pre-compiled packages, so you can install them on your machine and experiment. Uh, we also have some uh, information collected on uh, our web page here, and uh, the best sources for uh, information is either uh, Google or you can also use the manual pages. So if you are uh, searching for manual page of a specific MPI call, uh, you can, on, on our, for example, on the cluster, you can type man and then MPI underscore and then the name of the, the call. Okay, so this is how a very general, um, a, an MPI program looks in, in general. Um, so you have a, MPI is a library, so it comes as a library and uh, this library has so this is the C uh, version of the code. I'll show you a Fortran version after a while. Uh, so you, ha you start with including the MPI header file, which is named mpi.h. So you have to include this header file. And then uh, your program has to initialize the MPI library. So it's just, just, a, it's a, just a normal library. So you just add some uh, calls to your program uh, to make it parallel. It's not, not, in, not magic. It doesn't add anything to the language. You just write a new normal language that you use. You don't have to learn new language constructs or something. It's not an extension like OpenMP. It's just a set of library calls that you add to your program. Okay, so initialization of MPI is like this. You call MPI underscore init. And then you pass the two uh, arguments that you, the MPI, uh, the, the main program receives. And after the MPI is initialized, here communication and computation can happen. So before the MPI is initialized, all copies of the program run completely separately. So they, they, um, they run in so-called non-coordinated uh, mode. So they're like uh, just many instances of the same program started. They still don't know that they're part of a parallel job and they don't have their own unique IDs, so they cannot still do anything differently. Uh, before you, so after you call MPI init, some kind of magic happens, and then programs are become part of this MPI job. So after you have finished using MPI, it should be finalized by calling MPI finalize. Um, so this informs the MPI system that the, the current process has finished processing, and it's uh, it's no longer willing to participate in the MPI job. So this is, calling MPI init and MPI finalize is mandatory. If you don't do that, if you don't call MPI init, your process won't become part of the job. And if you don't call MPI finalize, th the program will crash. Because uh, if one process exits without finalizing, the MPI library would say, okay, this process uh, probably crashed or something, and then it will crash the whole job. So calling MPI init and MPI finalize is basically mandatory. After that, uh, your program can you can still have some code here. It's not mandatory to call MPI finalize and then exit immediately. You can do something else here, but your program is now no longer part of the MPI job, so you cannot communicate. You can just do some cleaning up, releasing memory or whatever. Okay, so this is C. So the Fortran uh, the Fortran version is uh, very similar. You just use the MPI module here. 
and then you call MPI init uh, and MPI finalize. It basically works the same as you see. You still have this non-coordinated serial mode here, and then you also have this uh, part here where the program is no longer parallel, and then the parallel things happen between MPI init and MPI finalize. And calling MPI init and MPI finalize is mandatory important too. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, general MPI program. So to discover uh, to discover the number, so once you have initial, once you have called MPI init, the program, the this, the current process becomes member of the uh, MPI job. And now, as a member of the MPI job, it can discover two things. It could call uh, MPI com rank to obtain. Uh, something which is called a rank. This is the how MPI calls this specific ID that each process gets. It's called a rank, and then uh, it, it can uh, you can use MPI com size to obtain the number of processes in the job. So with those two calls, you can get identification of the of the current process. Once you know how many processes are there, and once you know what is the current ID of this specific process in the job. You can use this information and make the current process do something different from the others. So, like, you can use the rank, and if you, for example, if you want to process a big array, you can use the rank and compute which part of the array has to be processed by the current nodes, by the current process. Sorry. Okay, so ranks are numbered uh, from zero. Uh, they start zero, one, two, three, up to n minus one, where n is the number of processes. So, if you run a program with two pro processes, so if you uh, launch an SPMD job with two processes, you'll get the number of pro processes will be equal to two. The first process will get an ID zero, and the second process will get an ID of one. So the same code in Fortran, you call MPI com size, and then you provide this communicator here. I'll talk a bit later about what this is. For and then number of processes, and then it was the same. So the, the difference between C and Photon is that in C there is an error code which is returned by the function and in Photon it's a subroutine so the error code is provided as the last argument of the um, of the call. Okay, so this is how it, so these are what I already told you about what ranks are basically, so this is the way to it, it distinguish the processes in the in MPI program. So this is one, what your program looks like after you launch it. So they are like many processes, but they're still anonymous because they don't know that the other processes exist. It then, it, it then they also don't know their own uh, ID in this uh, job. So once you call MPI init, each process gets assigned a number. So this number is called a rank, and now the processes are no longer anonymous. They have rank, and they also can obtain information of how many other processes are there. Okay, so the MPI covers this, so it definitely answers this first question here. So it provides way to know uh, which is the current process and how many other processes are there. So how about the, sec the other things? Now the basic primitives, so what MPI is about, it's about exchanging data, so message passing. And this is what MPI does best. I mean, it was, was, it was designed for that purpose. Uh, so MPI implements something which is called explicit message passing. So you have to, in explicit message passing, if you want to send the data from process A to process B, each process has to make a specific call, so uh, like a system call or something, to send this data. And uh, in MPI, there are two um, operations. So one operation is send, which is made by the process that wants to send the data. And the other operation is receive, which is made by the process which is willing to receive the data. And then um, the two processes has to agree on this thing, which means that the sender should specify that it wants to send the data to a process which is willing to receive data from the process which is sending. So th there should be explicit agreement about this thing. Uh, so once uh, those sent and receive match, this kind of data is transferred in something like which is called a message. So a message is an atomic um, da data unit. So it could be, um, this is an abstraction, abstract uh, thing. It could be like, uh, so it could be a many implemented as many small messages sent over a certain uh, network system. But from the point of view of a programmer like you, this data is an atomic unit. You just sent a message which consists of such and such data. And this message somehow gets transferred from process A to process B. So the, me the, the, the machine, 
mechanics of transferring uh, this data, the MPI library takes all the all the burden in it. So you just you don't have to know how this happens. You don't have to know what is the underlying uh, uh, library or what is the underlying uh, network which sits between the two processes or maybe they share uh, memory because they run the same uh, host or maybe they use some kind of uh, fast speed network like InfiniBand if they run on, on different uh, nodes. This is not your concern. This is the concern of the MPI library. You just make a call. You just say to MPI, please send this data to process number five. That's it from your point of view. So you have this send and receive primitives. Uh, and uh, in order to be, s to be able to send the data, you have to be able to identify whom do you want to send data and from whom uh, you want to receive the data. And you also have to specify what the data is. So how do you send data? Uh, this is the to do that, you have to use the MPI send. So MPI send is, um, you have to to specify two things in MPI send. So you have to specify um, the data that you want to send and where you want to send the data. So the it has a lot of arguments, but uh, this kind of arguments that you pass to MPI send is very typical in MPI. So you usually specify uh, triplets of data. So th the triplet in this case, the first triplet is this uh, pointer to the data. So you specify where the data is located in memory. And then you specify something which is a count. Uh, so most operations in MPI are vector oriented, which means that uh, you can send multiple items of the same type. You can send arrays because MPI was designed to work with Fortran initially and Fortran 77, the only data type that it has, which is like not non-scalar data type is array of scalars. So that's why the interface of MPI looks like this. I it's designed to work with arrays and you can um, send multiple items of the same type. So you can say where this data is located, how many data elements are there, and then you have to specify something which is called an MPI data type. So an MPI data type, I'll talk about this in details more later, but it, it tells MPI what kind of data elements are located in this uh, buffer. So th this triplet here, lo location, count and data type is very typical. You, you basically use this thing in all MPI calls. Um, or maybe m most MPI calls take this triplet of data. So this is how you identify where the data is. And then you have to identify where do you want to send the data. To do that, you specify the destination or the rank of the process that has to receive the data. And then each message uh, could be uh, tagged. So you can uh, add a tag, which is just an integer number uh, which could range from zero to some upper bound. Uh, so the standard says that the upper bound is at least 32,767, but most implementations provide you much uh, bigger uh, tag space. And you can use this tag to color the message. So you can have messages of different types. It doesn't change anything in the way that the message is uh, transferred. It doesn't change anything. It just allows you to attach this number so that you can use this to filter then uh, the receive uh, on the receiver, you can filter messages. So you can specify, for example, that you want to receive a message with a specific tag. And you can use this to somehow differentiate the messages because you have a single channel. You know, that you can have a single channel which transfers this, um, those messages. And having tags allows you to somehow uh, multiplex more things into this channel. And then, the whole communication happens in a certain context. And this context in MPI is called the communicator. So the communicators are very, the most basic communication context in MPI and they're very important because all communication happens in, in a context which is uh, called communicator. And MPI com world, which appeared here, this MPI com world is one example of a communicator. And this is the so-called world communicator in MPI. And it is created automatically when the program starts, and it encompasses all processes that have that are participating initially in the program. So when you launch uh, an MPI program, MPI com world is created automatically for you, and you can use it directly to communicate. And it contains all processes uh, in the MPI job. So the Fortran call is a subroutine, and it has basically the same arguments. So the data, you specify the where the data is, the count, the type, destination tag, communicator, and then uh, 
there comes this error argument. So this is just an integer output argument. And uh, it's a very uh, typical mistake for people who look at the C uh, interface, and then they you have only six arguments, and then they forget to put this error out output in uh, the Fortran call, and then the program, sometimes it compiles, sometimes it crashes, uh, doesn't compile, it depends on how your compiler uh, interprets the interfaces in the Fortran, and also depends how how well the MPI library uh, specifies those interfaces, but sometimes if you omit this, the program compiles and then crashes at runtime because you it misses an argument. Okay, so this is the two triplets, what and to whom. And then the reciprocal, uh, or the, yeah, the, 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 the other counter, uh, com counterpart of MPI send is MPI receive, which is the opposite operation. It's you have to issue this to receive data. So it has the same, basically, more or less the same uh, type of arguments. You, has, you still have this triplet here, which is like where to put the data. So where the, the buffer which is going to receive the data is located. And then you say uh, how big is the buffer. So you, you do not say how big is the message, but rather you specify how many elements of this uh, MPI data type can the buffer accommodate. And then uh, you have uh, to say from whom you would like to receive the data, what tag, and in which context. So which communicator uh, has to be used. So the when receiving data, uh, you can specify the so-called wildcards, like MPI any source and MPI any tag. So MPI any source allows you to receive a message from any other uh, process. So you can have one process receiving data from any other process. And you can also uh, have a tag uh, wildcard, which is MPI any tag, so you can receive messages with, uh, with, with, uh, without regarding what kind of tag they have. So you can either specify a specific value here for the tag, and then you will only receive a message that carries this specific tag, or you can specify MPI any tag, and then you can receive messages with all kinds of tags. So it doesn't matter what kind of tag uh, message carries. Also the same with uh, the, the sender here. Uh, and then uh, there is a special uh, output argument, which is called the status argument, where the when the operation finishes, you get some kind of information about the, the actual message. Uh, so you can either specif uh, specify here the address of uh, and the variable of the type MPS status, or you can uh, say MPS status ignore if you don't want to actually to receive the status of the operation. So MPS status ignore is some kind of constant that you put here instead of the status, and the MPI library won't write you uh, the status information. So what the status is actually useful for is if you have specified this wildcard here, in the status, there is information which contains the actual tag or the actual source. So you can examine the status and you can uh, find out which was the actual sender or what was the actual tag. So in this Photon interface, uh, the status is, uh, is an array. You'll see this for a while. Okay. Uh, MPA data types. So you have you have a language, and this language has some certain um, certain data types. So you you, to d you declare variables using, for example, integer, real, double, precision, or so on. Then, when you want to send a data of this type using MPI, you have to specify to MPI what kind of data is located there. And MPI provides uh, predefined data types, which in the in the certain binding, so in the photon binding, for example, MPI provides you constants or predefined data types that correspond to all the available data types, like primitive data types of the language. So you have something like MPI integer, which corresponds to integer data type in photon. You have this MPI real, MPI double precision, MPI complex, and so on. And then there is a special type which is called MPI bytes. And MPI bytes basically means one byte of data. Um, without any conversion. So ooh, we'll talk about this in a minute. In C, this is the same. You have MPI char, short, int, float, double, and sign char, and so on. So some implementations uh, provide uh, also uh, data types for more specific things, like int. Uh, so this is so data types like int4, int32, and so on. So there is machine independent uh, types in C, which define uh, integer, for example, of a certain size, because this int here could be machine dependent. It depends on what kind of architecture you have. It could be 64-bit, it could be 32-bit, it could be 16-bit. 
and then the corresponding MPI int that type will correspond to the language type and it also will be machine dependent. Okay, and also have this MPI byte here again. Okay, so what are these data types? So MPI is a library. It doesn't, um, it cannot infer the, the, the type of data that you have in your buffer. You have to, to tell it explicitly what kind of data is there because it's not a language extension and uh, it cannot query the type of data which is from the variable type. You have to spe specifically tell the library what kind of data is in the, the buffer. So uh, the C++ APIs used to have, uh, because they do no longer exist in MPI, but when they do, when they did, the interface provided overloaded uh, versions of send and receive, which could infer the data type from the type of the, uh, the, the pointer that was passed to the, uh, to the actual call. But still, this is just, just a wrapper. It's, it's, still not, um, it's still not a language extension. It cannot actually guess the type of data. And it's possible, for example, to cast a pointer to the wrong type and then the library will think that you are sending, for example, integer data because you're passing integer pointer pointer to integer, but still the data could be float or double precision or whatever. So you have to specify what kind of data is there. And MPI uses this to, um, to interpret the data when sending and receiving. So when it's sending the data, the MPI data type tells the library how to actually uh, pick the values from the memory and how to interpret them. So if you say that it is an uh, integer, for example, if the type, type is MPI int, the library will know, okay, this is 32 bit implementation, then I have to take four bytes from this location and interpret them as an integer value. Uh, so MPI was designed to also work in heterogeneous uh, environments, which means that you might have two nodes which run completely different operating systems and they could also have uh, completely different um, hardware implementation. So one of them could be 32 bit, the other one could be 64 bit. And then in this case, the integer will be different. And then they could also be of different hardware. So for example, one could be an Intel mach uh, x86 machine and that one could be, for example, uh, UltraSpark or something. And they have different way of representing data. So for example, on Spark or uh, power, power architectures, the data is in the so-called big endian. So when you have a multi-byte uh, data, the bytes are arranged in the same uh, way in memory as, uh, as they look like if you write just the, so yeah, uh, you, you have the most, the least, the least significant, the most significant byte is the first. While in Intel, it's the opposite way around. And then you have to, to transpose the data when sending from one machine to another. So MPI takes care of this. So if you provide the correct data type, if you say this is an MPI int type, then the library will take those four bytes and say, okay, I'm running on my Intel machine here. And then it will transpose the data. And when the data arrives at the other side, so it will transpose the data or trans uh, trans trans translate it into some in the machine independent format. And when it arrives on the other side, and then MPI receive specify that the buffer is MPI int, then the library will transfer, uh, translate again this machine independent format into an integer, which is, which matches the integer representation of this, uh, the receiver. So that's the idea of having to specify all those data types. And then you can also build your own data types consisting of uh, other data types. So you can build a very complex uh, data types in MPI uh, unfortunately, the course is too short, so I, I, I cannot uh, tell you much thing about uh, building your own data types, but they come very handy in MPI. Maybe then you can refer to some other course. Uh, so MPI byte uh, is used to, to send and receive data assets without any translations or conversion. And then it's strongly recommended or it's basically mandatory that the MPI data type matches the underlying uh, language data type. So if you have a integer value, you should use MPI int. If you have a float value, you should use MPI float and not MPI int. Although the float could be the same size as int, but still it could lead to a misinterpretation of the data. And then at the sender and the receiver, the data types should also match. You, you, can, you cannot send 
a data as MPI int and to receive it as MPI float because this is meaningless. Okay, so something about the return values and error handling in MPI. Uh, so in C, all MPI calls return an integer status. Uh, so if there is no uh, problem, MPI returns ap MPI success. So this is a constant. And then uh, in Fortran, all calls take an additional last argument. So there are very few exceptions of uh, actually functions in uh, Fortran, not subroutines, that return their value as the value of the function, but all subroutines basically take a diff uh, an additional argument as the last argument. And this argument receives the status of the MPI uh, call. So if everything goes okay, uh, the MPI returns MPI success. If, uh, if there is a problem, the return code is different. And then you can check what the return code is and take a specific action. But you don't actually need to do that in most cases because the default um, error handler in MPI. So if an error occurs, MPI first calls an error handler. And this error handler does something. And if this error handler returns to the library, then it returns you the error code. But the default error handler in MPI just terminates your job. So you don't actually have to uh, check the return code. It's either uh, MPI success or your program crashes. So this is the default MPI handler, which aborts the, the application. You usually get uh, some information about what happened. For example, uh, wrong arguments or uh, network problem or something like this. And you get this information from the library and then your program terminates. So you have to do something, you have to make some MPA calls in order to force the library not to terminate, but instead to return the code back to you. Um, the problem is that not many MPA libraries are actually able to continue after an error. So that's why the default is uh, to crash your application. And uh, recovering from an error is, is a tricky business and uh, it's not very portable because not all MPA implementations support um, continuation after uh, after some kind of network problem. Okay, so this is uh, how you combine MPS and MPI receive. So this is MPI sent in one process, and this is MPI received in, another in a different process. So the, let's say process uh, with rank one has this variable B, and process with rank zero has this variable A. So it's a scalar variable of uh, type int. So this one says MPA sent, it gives the address of uh, the variable B, it says one element of type MPI integer because it's a scalar, so in scalar it's the number should be one. And then it specifies that it wants to send to program with rank zero, so this is rank zero here, and the tag should be zero, and then it specifies the communicator should be MPA com world. And this one has MPI receive, it says I want to receive the data into this variable here, and it's it can hold one uh, element of type MPI int. I want to receive the data from process with rank one. The tag should be zero, and then the communicator should be MPI com world, and I want to get the status into this uh, status variable. So when this happens, so when the, the those things here matches the one here, so this number here matches the, the, the number here. So these are the so-called matching uh, sent and receive. Matching means that the sender has specified the rank of uh, the rank of the receiver in the call and the receiver has specified the rank of the sender so you have a mutual um, matching of the of the ranks also the tags match here so this is zero and this is zero the communicator is the same so mpa com world mpa com world and when this happens communication happens so the, the message is transferred from here to here so if this was a single traded application so if it's just a serial application you would do something like a equals b but in this case, you have a distributed application, so A and B are in different processes. So you cannot just say A equals B. You have to say MPI send, MPI receive. So there are some um, experiments, like uh, special languages, that can actually allow you to express the same concept with something like A0 equals B1. And then the compiler will basically, you, you compile the application, it, would, it could generate an MPI application that has those calls here. So there is one thing which is called Universe Parallel C, uh, Uniform Parallel C, UPC. Uh, it's a call to the so-called partitioned, global partition uh, address space language, PGAS. Uh, 
it has certain constructs like this. So you can express message passing using just uh, normal assignment operators with some extensions to the language. So this is what you basically do, uh, and then you can combine lots of MPA sent and receives to uh, to do uh, the parallel job. So having MPA sent and MPA receive is allows you is like 90% of the things that you uh, can do in parallel programming you can do with only MPA sent and MPA receive. Okay, so MPA solves those problems here. So now you know how you can specify who you want to send the data. You know you can specify how much data you can specify, what kind of data. So unfortunately, MPA does not provide an intrinsic mechanism to uh, uh, to notify you if the data has arrived. But you can still, uh, for example, you can send one message with data, and then there could be some, for example, the, the other process could send a message back. And when you get this message back, you know that the first message has been delivered because MPA always guarantees you that if uh, if you make a message passing call and if it completes, it means the message has somehow arrived there. So uh, messages cannot overtake each other. There is it, it maintains the order in the mess in which the messages have been uh, sent, and then you can uh, you can implement your own mechanism to notify the process if uh, if the data has arrived. But still, if MPI send completes, it means that the data has started to be um, be delivered somehow, but it doesn't mean that it has arrived. So this is some some very tricky part of the semantics in MPI. You cannot know the data has actually arrived because there could be intermediate buffering uh, mechanisms. So the data might be buffered at the receiver, but it could still might be the MPI received there has not completed. So there's some uh, trickiness, but still you can send a message back, and then you know that the first message has been delivered. Okay, so this is a uh, an example how you do things in MPI. So, for example, he, you call MPI init here, then you obtain the size of the communicator or the number of processes that are running the job. Then you obtain the rank or the ID of the current process. And then, for example, if the rank equals zero, then you can issue MPI receive. So this is an implementation of this thing here. If the if my rank equals zero, then you receive the data. Otherwise, if the rank equals one you send the data. So this is very important here. Why has anyone idea why this one here is in red? So why do I um, stress here this thing? So for example, why this else if, why it's not just else? Yeah? What? Sorry? Uh, no? Because here we have specified explicitly the rank. Um, nope. Okay, so what will happen if you run a program with like four processes? So if this is only else without the if here, you have four processes, one of them will be receiving, so this will be process with rank zero, and all the other three processes will be executing this branch here, so they will be sending the message. But this one has posted only a single receive, and this receive is only for process with rank one. So there will be two processes, like rank two and three, that will be sending the message to process zero, which will not expect this message. And then those sends here will block, because there will be no matching receives, and then the program will never end. It will just block. Okay? And the third what was the idea. So each process has to do something which is meaningful. And then all the sends and receives should match. So you should not just throw in uh, one send and then not have a matching receive. So all the number of sends and receives in the whole program should match. So every send should be matched by a receive. That's the, that's the idea here. No, no. If you have an MPI sent without a matching receive, this won't give you an error message because it could happen that later the, the process will issue the receive. It doesn't have to happen at the same time. So this diagram here is maybe a bit misleading, but this could be very widely separated in time. 
Okay, so once you have the program, you have to compile it. Uh, and because MPI is a library, it comes with a lot of uh, header files, libraries that you have to link to your program and so on. And these usually are very dependent on the vendor of the library. So to provide some kind of uh, abstraction, uh, MPI provides the so-called compiler wrappers uh, that you can use to compile your program uh, more portably. So instead of using the C compiler, CC, you just uh, use MPI CC. And instead of C++, you use MPI C++, and then there is a wrapper for, M for Fortran. So when you, you just replace your compiler with the compiler wrapper, and the compiler wrapper from the library, it adds all the necessary flags, all the necessary include uh, directories, all the necessary libraries, if there should be some specific linkage things. It provides all of this information, so you don't have to bother with the com current implementation, what libraries are necessary, and so on. Uh, and then uh, some libraries might provide a bit of a different names for the wrappers themselves. So on our cluster environment, we um, define special uh, variables, environment variables like uh, $MPICC. So this one gives you the name of the MPI wrapper for the C compiler of the currently loaded MPI uh, module. Because yesterday uh, you saw that there is this module system, so you can uh, have a module which, for example, brings you open MPI, or there is a module which brings you Intel MPI. And in Intel MPI, the compiler is ICC, because it's designed to work with the Intel compiler. And then the name of the compiler is not MPI CC, but MPI ICC. So there is this one I more. And then um, if you use, a, for example, a different version of the library with a different compiler, there might be some, some uh, difference in the name. So that's why it's we recommend that on our cluster, but this is only on our cluster system, that you use this uh, environment variables when you build your programs. It just simplifies you the thing. So you can switch from one implementation to a different implementation, and your program will still build with the same make file or the same commands. Okay, so this is just an example. Uh, if you, most MPI compiler wrappers support this uh, dash dash show argument. And they show you what arguments are ap appended to the to the compiler flags. So this is just an example of uh, open MPI uh, built with Intel compiler. And if you type there dash show, you get all this. So this is this is what is added by the, the wrapper to the commands that you give to, to the command uh, line options that you give to the compiler. I mean, you have if you have to type this every time when you compile your program, it will be a bit tedious, right? So the that's why these compiler wrappers exist. So it allows, for example, it uh, gives the include path, and then the include path, and then enables handling of, uh, handling of exceptions, and uh, multi-threading, and then links uh, the path to the libraries, and then it hard codes the path to the libraries in the, in the executable, and then this MPI library, dynamic linker, and then the NSL util different libraries which are necessary for the library itself. So these are dependent, uh, dependencies for open MPI. So you don't have to remember all this stuff. You just say MPICC dash O, the name of the executable, and then you give the name of the program. And that's it from your point of view. And all this gets handled by the wrapper. OK, now we have the executable file. That's good. But how do you start it? So how do you start like 100 copies of this executable file? Well, there is a special um, launcher program, which is usually called MPI exec. So this is how the standard names the, the, the launcher if one ex exists, it's called MPI exec. Many implementations provide an alternate uh, file, which uh, program, which is called MPI run. So you should usually check for MPI exec, and if MPI exec does not exist, maybe you should try MPI run. If it doesn't have MPI run, maybe you should consult the manual of the platform. Because, for example, uh, the blue gene, it has a completely different program, which is called run job. So the MPI standard doesn't say how the processes are launched because it tends, it wants to be as platform independent as possible, and that's why this is abstracted. So you don't uh, have to, uh, so the standard doesn't say that it has, there has to be a program which is called MPI exec, but the standard says if there is a program, it should be better named MPI exec. It's a recommendation, it's not a requirement of the standard. Okay, so you have MPI exec, you specify dash N, and you say how many copies of the program you want. 
for example, 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or 5. And then you give uh, additional arguments. There might be additional specific to the vendor uh, arguments. And then you give the name of the program and then you give the arguments of the program. So what happens is that this program with those arguments gets started that many times, possibly on different nodes, uh, maybe on the same node. It depends on, the on many different things. Uh, we have this interactive uh, mode on our cluster. So for the, the course, you'll be using the interactive mode because it's uh, quicker and uh, you get the results almost immediately. Um, so you type dash, uh, we also have a mpexec wrapper, so you just have to type this dollar uh, mpexec uh, dash n, for example, you say like 5, and then you give the name of the program. If you run, if you run an MPI program in a, as a batch drop, then you have to specify things like this. So you have to uh, say again dash dollar mpexec, and then we provide a special uh, flag for each uh, different MPI implementation. So you have to put this flags MPI batch in the script, and then again the program name and the argument of the program. Okay, so the MPI solves this problem. So solves the problem of starting the program and. Uh, so also, once you start the program with MP exec, what you get is you get an input-output redirection. So you, you can see the standard output of all uh, processes. So it does this for you. And you can also uh, you can press Control-C, for example. And when you press Control-C, all started processes will be killed. So the MP takes care of starting and terminating the program and also delivering signals to the processes. OK. And then uh, the synchronization comes later. Um, OK, do I have time? I'm a bit short on time, so maybe I'll just continue. And then during the, the lab session, we'll see how to uh, build a simple MVP application. <coughs> OK, so each message has something which is called an envelope. So it's like the data is packed into this uh, container, and the container uh, has some identification to it. And this identification is called an envelope. So it consists of uh, information of who is the, so the sender of the data, uh, where is the destination of the data, and then uh, what is the tag of the message, or the color, or the additional tag, and then in which communicator this message has to be delivered. <coughs> so when you send a, a message, you specify explicitly the destination, the tag, and the communicator, while the source is implicit, so it's taken from the rank of the current process, who makes the send call. In the receiver, you specify explicitly the source, the tag, and the communicator, but the destination is the, de is the rank of the current process. And then those things here, those fields here, has to match. So this is called uh, an, an envelope matching. And uh, this matching has to be uh, perfect, and then only the, the receiver can specify this wildcard here. So if you specify MP any source, it will match any source. And if you specify MP any attack, it will match any attack. Okay, so this, um, so these arguments here should match the arguments here. This is the message envelope. Okay, and then uh, the standard expects that the data type on both sides should match. So if you send an integer value from one process, then you should receive an integer value in the other process. So the what is uh, important is that most implementations do not enforce this. So th to keep the messages as short as possible, so that because MPI strikes to achieve maximum performance, which means that the things should be done in the most optimal way, and sometimes being optimal means that things are not verbose and not um, a lot of error checking and things are done. Uh, that's why most implementations do not infor enforce this requirement of the standard. So y you can have one send which sends an integer value, and on the receiver side you can specify MPI float, and because int and float of the same size on most platforms, they'll be like 32 bit. This will usually work. Of course, you'll get meaningless information in the, in the receiver, but it will still work, so you won't get any error. So there are special tools like uh, MAST tool that we uh, kind of develop here, which can, uh, you run your program and then it collects information of what's going, what's being sent, where and how, and then it can check if everything is okay according to the standard. And then if you run this program, with uh, unmatching data types in MAST, it will tell you, hey, you have uh, sent and received, but the data types do not match. So you should take uh, some 
some measures about this. And then uh, sends and receives are atomic, which means if you have a receive where you specify that you want to, you have a buffer of two elements, this receive will only match a single MPA send. If you have two MPA sends which send one element each, this won't work because this is an incomplete. So the first MPA send will be matched by the receive, but the second MPA send will not be matched. You, it, you have to always uh, have the same number of sends as are the receives in total, in all processes in the, in the MPI program. This is a correct MPI program. Okay, and then, okay, this will be matched, this won't be matched, and then this process here will just block or something. Okay, so then if you send a message, you do not, in the receiver, you do not specify how big the message is. You specify how big the buffer for the message is. And if the message is smaller than the buffer, then that's okay. It will just take part of the buffer. If the message is bigger than the buffer, so if the sender count is bigger than the receive count, you get an error because the message cannot be stored in that much space and you get a truncation error which means that the program will abort in most cases. You get uh, error message uh, truncated and then it will say that the received count is too less and then the program will abort and then you have to look at your program and see why this happens, probably run into a program debugger and see why this happens. Okay, and then uh, when, in this case here, when you have a smaller message, uh, you can examine the status and to, to see how big the message was actually. So the status, in C++ it's a structure which holds the, the, the those uh, which has this um, structure entries here it's like m status dot mpa underscore source I know it's a very bad naming of uh, fields but the the field is with capital letters so the field which is mpa underscore source gives you the the rank of the process which sent the message MPI underscore tag gives you the tag of the message and MPI underscore error gives you the status code. So in most cases the status code will be just MPI success. Uh, okay, MPI receive returns you the status code and you also get the same status code here. Why? Well, because there are some operations in MPI which uh, return the status later. So they do not, uh, so they, for example, they can send the data later and then you can return the return value from the call means that the call was successful and it doesn't mean that actually the, the receive operation was successful and then you can uh, retrieve the status of the operation later and then you can see a different status code there which will be the status of the operation itself I mean you'll see this for the non-blocking operations in Fortran this is very important uh, the status is an array it is an integer array which is of size MPA status size. So you have to declare an integer array, uh, and then there are constants like MPA source, stack, and error, which are basically indices in the array where the, this information is stored. So you can say status, MPA source, and this is the probably the first element of the array, which gives you the rank. And then there is uh, this one, which gives you the tag, and then which gives you the status code. Um, okay, you can, uh, you can you can do something which is like if you want to receive a message of an unknown size you can do two things you can first allocate a very big buffer and hope that this buffer is big enough to hold all kind of messages or you can do something else you can just probe for a message so probing for a message is like receiving without actually receiving so you specify uh, a filter what kind of message what kind of source tag and communicator uh, the message the receive should be and then uh, this thing blocks until a, a message which matches those criteria here arrive. So when the message arrives, you get the status as a result from MPI probe. Then you can examine the status. And uh, once you examine the status, you know, okay, this message is like that big. Then you can allocate a buffer. And then you can issue MPI receive with the so source, the tag, and the communicator from the that has been used here. So for example, this is very useful. Uh, you can probe for messages from any any source. For example, you can specify MP any source, any tag in some communicator, and then you can get the status. And then you can use MPI get count to actually examine how many elements are in this in that message. So you you get you provide the status 
um, structure here. And then you say uh, what kind of data type you expect the message to be, for example, MPI int. And then in the status, there is a field which says how big, how many bytes are there. So this field is hidden for you because it's implementation dependent. But MPI get count can use the field to actually say, okay, there are 40 bytes. This guy wants MPI int. So then four divided by four is like 10 elements. You need to say, okay, there are 10 elements in, the me in, the, in this message. So then you can use this count here is returned by MPI get count. You can allocate a buffer of 10 integers, like malloc or new or whatever. And then you can issue MPI receive into this buffer. It's as simple as this. So my it might happen that uh, the data type that you provided is, is not compatible with the message. For example, the message, uh, the, the size of the message is not divisible by the length of the data type. And then, uh, you get MPI undefined, which means that uh, the, the, the size is not compatible with the, this data type, which means probably the message was of a different data type. Uh, so there is something which is called deadlock. This is a very um, common problem in MPI. If you have a symmetric code like this one, for example, you, you have two processes. One of them wants to send to the other and then wants to receive from the other. You want to exchange information. This is a very common scenario in MPI, exchanging data, for example, in, in some kind of uh, processing. Uh, if this process wants to send to this one and this one wants to, to, to send to this one and then the vice versa, the receive operations. So this send here should be matched by this receive. And this send should be matched by this receive. And, and here comes the problem. Is this if this send here is matched by this receive, this receive will not be executed before this send has completed. And this send will not be com completed before it has received the data from here. And then this presents a bit of a problem. It's called deadlock because each process waits for the other to, to in order to be able to, to progress its operations further, so to come from here to here. But this never happens because the other process has stuck here in the send which is waiting for this receive, and this receive here is waiting for this send. So this operation is co so this is called a deadlock because the process is blocked here, and both ranks wait, and the program will just stop executing, and nothing will happen anymore. So you have to terminate the program. Uh, this could be solved by uh, so the simplest case is just you just replace the, the exchange the send and receive in the first rank. So now the send will complete, and then the, the, the receive here will match this send, and this send will match this receive here. But this is a bit asymmetric. So you have to, if you write a program with only two processes, it's easy. You just type if my rank equals zero, then send, otherwise receive. And then if my rank equals zero, or if, if my rank equals zero, send, then receive. Otherwise, if my rank is one, receive, then send. Right? This works. But if you have a bigger program with many ranks, and it, it becomes a bit complicated. So how do you solve this problem? Well, MPA provides a special call, which is called MPA send receive. It is a combination of both send and receive. So it gets a lot of arguments here. It gets all the arguments that you pass to MPI send, and all the arguments that you pass to MPI receive. Uh, it's th the only thing that is in common is basically the communicator. But this call here is guaranteed that it never deadlocks. Even if you have scenario like this, it will never deadlock because th the call itself is implemented in such a way that the send and the receive can proceed at the same time. Okay, it sends one message and receives one message. Of course, there could be a deadlock if, for example, you specify a uh, rank if you specify a receiver which is not listening, so if you have an unmatching sent to receive operation uh, ranks, but then if everything is perfect, so if you can specify it always a process which is expecting a message, it will never deadlock. Uh, so the, the here the sent and the, the receive should not overlap because the operations could happen at any time. And if you want to actually send data from one place and then receive data in the same place, MPA provides this MPA send receive replace call, uh, which is a bit more, um, well, it has less arguments because it puts some more restrictions on the kind of data that can be 
so the, send the sender and the receiver should have the same amount of data here. So because the count argument is the same. You do not have a separate send count and receive count here, you have the same count, which means that the message which is sent and the message which is received should be of the same size. Uh, but still, you can use this to replace data. So, if, for example, in some, uh, if your algorithm requires that you exchange somehow the data with your neighbor processes, you can use MPS and receive replace. So, usually, send receive replace is slower than send receive because it also guarantees you that the data is first sent and then received. While send receive could send the data and receive the data in any order. So, it could happen that the send happens first and then the receive, or the receive first, the send first then it doesn't matter. The idea is that those operations will happen no matter how or no matter in what order, but they will happen without deadlocking. Here you also won't have deadlock, but the order is guaranteed, and then this operation runs a bit slower. So if you write a program, and if you don't actually need MPS and receive replace, you should actually use MPS and receive. And now just a quick, um, yeah. Those operations, like MPS send and receive, are blocking. So what means blocking? It means that when your program makes the call, so if you make a call like MPI send in your program, and the execution is transferred to the MPI library, your program does not get control back before the operation has completed. For example, if you have a sender and a receiver here, so this is the sender process and this is the receiver process, and the sender calls MPS send, there is a certain um, number of operations that happen behind the scenes. For example, first, uh, the, the, the sender sends the envelope to the receiver, and then it waits until the receiver has posted the, match it, the matching receive. So once this happens, the receiver somehow acknowledges that, okay, there is a matching receive for this uh, message, start transmitting now. And then the sender will send the message, will send the message, will send part of the message, and then after the last part of the message has been sent, then this MPA sent will return control back to you. Uh, that's why th the case where you have process which is trying to send and then to receive, and if you, if you have two processes doing the same thing, because the send cannot complete before the message has been transferred, in this case, that's why the processes will just block in MPA sent, because MPA sent will not re return to you before this operation has completed. And of course, it cannot complete before the MPI receive has been posted because of this uh, acknowledgement here. Okay, so while this thing happens, uh, the data must remain constant, which means that the, the buffer that you have supplied to MPI, this data buffer, could be accessed at any time while MPI send is running. So if you have a multi threaded program, you should not touch the buffer while the MPI call is uh, in progress. The same uh, applies to MPI receive, so the data should not be used before the MPI receive has returned. Okay, but this presents, um, in many cases, it is possible that you initiate sending the data, and then you actually don't need this data for some amount of time. You can do some other computations, or you can do something else. So in these cases, you can post the so-called non-blocking operations, and non-blocking operations are operations that you initiate and then the MPI call returns immediately back, so it gives you control back, but the actual sending of the data or the receiving of the data happens later, or happens together uh, in an asynchronous uh, thread or something. Uh, so this, for this case, MPI provides you this MPI I send and MPI I receive. Uh, they look like the standard send and receive, so the, like the blocking one, but they provide you with this special request argument here. So you call MPI I send. You provide the same arguments that you would usually provide to MPI send. So you provide the data buffer, the count, the data type, the destination tag communicator, and so on. But then you provide the special output argument here request. And this call completes immediately. And you get in the request something which is called a request handler. So a, a handle, sorry, not handler, a request handle. And this handle can later be used to check if the actual operation has completed, because the operation continues in the background or asynchronously. So for MPI receive, uh, you provide the request here, so there is no status output. So the status you get when you examine the request. And because this receive here, so the call 
it returns immediately and it will return an MPS success, which means that the actual receive has been started. But now imagine that it happens that the buffer was too short. And then the message comes, the message is too short, it cannot fit into the buffer. And then there is this truncation error that occurs. So you cannot get the, trun the truncation error from MPI receive because when MPI receive completes, this I receive, when it completes, it means only that the receive has been started. So it cannot return you that there is a truncation error because the truncation happens later. So when you call uh, something like MPI wait, this is one of the calls that you can use to test, to wait for the actual operation to complete. So when it completes, you get the status here. And inside the status, this MPI error argument will be set, so not the argument, but the MPI error uh, field will be set to truncation error. Because MPI wait itself, it cannot return truncation because truncation is not something which happens when you wait for something. It happens, it is a property of the receive operation. It's not property of the wait operation itself. So the wait cannot truncate because the wait has no buffers. So you do not specify any buffers to the wait. Wait here is only used to wait for the actual operation to finish. So that's why the status field, uh, so the status structure has an additional error argument, which could seem sometimes like uh, redundant, but it's actually not redundant. It's only, it's the, the idea is to use it in th those cases, like with the synchronous operations. Okay, so you have started a send or you have started a receive, and then uh, you can use MPI wait to wait for the actual uh, operation to complete. So you provide this request that you have received here, you provide it to MPI wait, and MPI wait blocks until the operation has completed. So basically, if you combine MPI I send, and then immediately after, if you call MPI wait with the same request that you get here, this is absolutely equivalent to just calling MPI send. Okay, so once the operation is complete, this request will be set to MPI request null. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can test, uh, so you can call MPI wait several times, maybe you have a loop or something. If you call it with request which is MPI request no, it will do nothing. So you can, it won't crash if you call it several times. And then um, the request is freed in this case. And then you get the status here in the output argument. Okay, so the non-blocking calls return immediately and then you can continue doing other things while the operations continue in the background. Um, so then the in C, the request is a structure. In uh, Fortran, it's just an integer number that you get. And then uh, those asynchronous operations are, they have something which is called progression. So for the operation to, to actually happen, it has to be progressed or moved on because each operation is a sequence of events. And then this progression uh, happens at certain points in MPI. Uh, for example, when you wait for a non-blocking operation, it's progressed until it completes. But you can also test the operation if it has completed. So testing is like a non-blocking wait. You just probe if the operation is still going on or if it has completed. So there is this test operation. So as I already said, you can if you combine a non-blocking operation and immediately after you wait for it, it's just the same as you if you do a blocking uh, call. So here is a another. So this is how it was without uh, with two blocking calls. Now, uh, if you say MPI I send and then immediately MPI wait, it's the same. So basically, this thing here is equivalent to this thing here, so but implemented with non-blocking calls. So still we don't get anything useful for using non-blocking calls. So to make it useful, it's like this case. You can put some work here between the MPI send and MPI wait. Because this work here could happen probably together with the actual sending of the data. Of course, this work here should not in any way access the buffer that has been supplied to MPI send. And this uh, work here should not access the buffer which has been supplied to MPI I receive. Because w before you call MPI wait here, th those operations might still be uh, going on, which means that the buffer here might be accessed later. So if you met, uh, messed up with the content of the buffer, you might send, uh, you might get out the message. And if you access the, the receive buffer here, you might get an incomplete message there. So. This is another way to resolve uh, the, the, the deadlock case with send and receive. You can, instead of using 
send receive, you can use, for example, I receive to start a non-blocking receive, and then you can use send. And then on the other side, you also have I receive and send. And then this I receive here starts, and then the send will match this I receive here, and this send here will match this I receive here. And there will be no deadlocks because of this operation going in the background. So this will return immediately. This will return immediately. Then the send will be matched by the already started non-blocking receive on the other side. So it will eventually return. And when it returns, this wait here will complete the receive operation. So this is how MPI send to receive is actually implemented in many cases, in many libraries. So Open MPI implements uh, MPI send to receive exactly using uh, those uh, combination of I send, I receive, and then completes I send, I think, or vice versa. It doesn't matter. It's the same. And then there is this non-blocking uh, request testing. You just say MPI request, uh, you give the request, and then you give th you have this flag which is set to true if the operation has been completed. So test returns almost immediately. It's, it's unlike wait, it doesn't wait for the operation to complete. It just uh, gives you an indication if the operation is has completed or if uh, it's still going on. And this one is intended to be called in the loop. So if you have a processing loop in your program, you can put MPI test uh, so that in a, at each iteration of the loop, uh, the test is executed. And uh, the test progresses only a little bit of the operation. So it's you might need to call MPI test many, many times, for for example, for a non-blocking send or non-blocking receive to be completed. Unlike wait. So when you call wait, it just waits for the operation. It completes it. While test is meant to be as fast as possible. So that's why you might need to call it many times. And it's intended to be called in a loop. So that's the idea. Uh, there are some uh, variants of those. So you have MPI wait any, where you can specify an array of requests, and it terminates when one of them is ready. Uh, wait all, you supply an array of requests, and it terminates when all requests are ready. And then uh, wait some terminates if any number of requests are ready. So MPA any and some are similar to a certain extent, but any terminates on the first request, while some tries to terminate to to complete as much as many requests as possible, but not all of them. And there are also test uh, variations of those. Okay, and then um, okay, so now I have to tell you something about the modes. Um, MPA has several modes which are connected to how uh, the actual transfer of the data, so the completion of the transfer of the data matches to the completion of the, uh, the actual MPI call. And then you have something which is called a synchronous mode. So like in synchronous mode, when you say send the data in synchronous mode, the send will not complete until an the receiver has said, okay, MPI, I want to receive. So the receiver has posted the receive. And only then will the, the send complete. You can have a buffered mode, which means that when you say MPI send, the message is copied to a buffer somewhere, and you get back control. And the message might be delivered a bit later. So the actual transfer of the data could happen after the, the MPI send has returned. So this creates a bit of a, a synchron, uh, synchronicity. If you want to be sure that the receiver has posted a receive, you should use synchronous mode. And then there is the standard mode, uh, which is the, the most uh, widely used mode. It is a combination of buffered and synchronous. So there is nothing set about how it is actually implemented, but the standard says that it is it terminates or it returns you either when the message has been transferred, which means that it acts actually as a synchronous send, or copied somewhere to an external storage, to, uh, to an uh, internal buffer for later delivery. The difference between standard and buffered is that in buffered mode, you specifically give the buffer where the message has to be stored. And then there is uh, one mode, which I won't well, skip because nobody uses it. So each mode has a different function name. So you have bsend for buffered, ibsend for non-blocking buffered, ssend for synchronous, ISN for non-blocking synchronous, and so on. And then for the buffered mode, you have to give your own buffer by calling MPI buffer attach. So you have to give a big enough buffer, and then you specify where it is and how big it is. And then you have to detach it at some point. Okay, and there are some utility calls like MPI abort. 
which aborts the application with a certain error code. Then MPIW time, so this is not, uh, so this one that returns you seconds, like a, a floating point value of seconds from some point in the past. You can call it twice and uh, subtract the values. So the point in past is not defined, so you should call it twice and then when you subtract the values, you get the amount of time that has elapsed between the two calls. And this is a very high resolution timer, so the standard advises that the most, uh, the, the best high resolution timer is should be used for the library to implement a call. And it actually gives you microsecond resolution in many cases. So you, you should use this instead of uh, get time of date or clock or whatever operating system specific call you might use to benchmark your program. Just use MPI double time. And then there is this MPI get processor name, which obtains uh, identification of the processor, uh, which executes the, the current, where the current program uh, or copy of the program executes. If you use this on the cluster, you get the host name usually of uh, the, the node. And then you can, uh, because the MPI can be only initialized once in the lifetime, so you can call MPI init only once and MPI finalized only once. If you call them more than once, you get an error message. Uh, that's why you can check uh, with MPI initialized if the library has been initialized and with MPI finalized if the library has been finalized. This is useful if you're writing a library. If you write uh, a library that uses MPI, you can check if the programmer has already initialized MPI, and if not, you call MPI init. If, if, it's, if MPI has already been initialized, you can skip the call to MPI init. So that, that's, that's what those calls are for. And then uh, I just want to give you a quick example of some pitfalls, because uh, afterwards we're starting with the lab exercises. Uh, a very common mistake that I see a lot of times here is that you have to provide a buffer. So when, when you say where the buffer is, you have to provide a pointer to the buffer. And in many cases, people tend to use things like new or malloc to locate dynamically memory. And then instead of passing the, the pointer itself, they tend to pass pointer to the pointer. Because in many examples, you see the, the ampersand operator. But if you do that with a pointer, you're actually sending the address of the pointer and not the target which the pointer points to. So if you have a pointer, like this one here, you should actually use the pointer or you should use the pointer to the first element of the array, not pointer to the pointer. Otherwise, you'll get an error and this error is really hard to debug. If you have a scalar, you should pass an ampersand here. If you have an array, you can either give the name of the array or you can give a pointer to the first element of the array. So you can also give a pointer to the array itself. It works because pointer to the array has the same address, but it's a different type of pointer. And uh, in the C++ case, it might uh, give you a problem. So this is how you use uh, with arguments of a function. If you have a scalar argument, give the pointer to it. If you, if you have a, a argument which is passed by address, just directly use it because this is just a pointer. If you have a, an array, uh, it applies the same. Either give the name of the array or uh, have a, a pointer to the first element. So here is why you should not actually use ampersand array, because in this case, you'll be sending a pointer to the pointer and you'll have a problem. Uh, also, MPI doesn't understand uh, pointer hierarchies. It only works with flat memory structures. So if you have a two-dimensional array, it's okay to send it uh, that way. Uh, oh, this is probably, yeah, I made a mistake. <laughs> this should not be here. Anyway, but if you, if you have a, a dynamically allocated array, like this one here, so this is a matrix which is 10 by 10. If it's a static matrix, it's okay. You just, you can send it like this. You say mat today, MPI in 10 by 10. If you allocate it with new, but you use a one dimensional array, it's also okay. You can just send it. But if you use something like, this is very common. So some people use array of arrays. So they make, for example, an uh, array of 10 pointers and then allocate each row in this uh, thing. So this won't work. So MPI will not follow this uh, hierarchy of pointers. You have to use a flat memory space. Okay, so this uh, sending pointers is basically meaningless because you have virtual desk spaces, so a pointer in one process is completely meaningless in a different process. But if you have some data structure and if you have a pointer which is relative to the beginning of the data structure, so this is a pointer which is like offset, 
then it's okay because in most cases if you have the same architecture on most machines the, the, the offsets will be the same but if you have a heterogeneous environment it won't work so generally don't send pointers around send data not pointers to data and then in Fortran uh, one uh, it's only one um, thing to note in Fortran 90 you can pass slices array slices like for example if you have this 10 by 10 uh, matrix and if you want to cut uh, three columns of it you can specify this like uh, dot here and then one by three if you have a non-blocking call and if you pass it a slice this might be a problem because uh, the compiler usually creates a temporary copy of this uh, slice here when it's passed to uh, iSend and because the iSend operation continues in the background and this temporary copy might get destroyed whenever after the, the call has returned it might happen that um, this, th this temporary copy is destroyed and then the operation actually starts and then it will access memory which does not exist anymore or where the data is no longer current so just don't pass matrix sli array slices to non-blocking operations in Fortran. In MPA 3.0 this problem is already fixed so you can use slices there but there are not many MPA implementations in the wild that support this uh, new Fortran interface. Okay, there's a lot of information and a lot more is coming in the afternoon, so if there is any questions.